so Daniel Peters is the founder of the Fashion Minority Report, designed to equate to create equality within the fashion industry and create a sector for diverse professionals by advancing the conversation around inclusion and diversity to a point of measurable change. And we all know that we need some measurable change here. Um, CC Olisa is the co-founder of the CurvyCon, a groundbreaking plus-size fashion convention held during New York Fashion Week, and the founder of Coco by CC, a, a beauty company on a mission to redefine beauty and empower one million women to prioritize self-care and over, o, overall well-being. Today, they're in conversation about celebrating beauty in body diversity. Welcome, CC and Daniel. Hi, how is everybody? Good morning. Take it away. Cool. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear uh, me, Dan? I can. Um, if my Wi Fi is terrible at any point, just let me know because then I might have to run back to my desk. Um, but look, it's really great to be with you today, Cece. Um, I know that you've got many things happening. Um, so it's really great to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, what we're going to talk about today is that one dimension of diversity that is often left out of the DEI conversation is body size. Um, but like other human differences, uh, body size, composition, type, and shape are all characteristics that make us unique, kind of leaning into our intersectionality. Um, in much of our society, have a um, in much of our society, sorry, I got to off. However, outdated biases and social stigmas influence what bodies are considered beautiful. Smaller bodies in particular, in particular when we think about the fashion industry. Um, what about uh, in our digital spaces? So I'm Daniel Peters, I'm the founder of Fashion Minority Report, and I'm gonna be in conversation with Cece Olissa, who is the founder of the CurvyCon and also Coco by Cece. Um, I think just to kick off Cece, um, it would be great to just learn a little bit about you to kind of start off. Yes, absolutely. So first of all, thank you all uh, for being here and for listening in on our chat. You know, for me, I I started off as a plus size fashion blogger. Um, I live in New York City. And so as part of my work in plus size fashion, a community built around uh, my message of self-confidence, which is don't wait on your weight to live the life you want. And what I find often, I know Daniel's going to kind of find a new spot. So Daniel might be moving around while I chat for a bit, but hopefully I'll uh, be able to entertain you all for a little while. Um, what I have found in my work is often that when it comes to women particularly and building confidence, sometimes it can be hard to be what you can't see. And that can manifest itself even in something as simple as shopping for clothes. If you understand that 67% of American women wear above a size 14, and then you walk into you know, American stores and you don't necessarily see that reflected, well, for the woman who wants to express herself through style, you suddenly realize that she is limited in the way that she can do that. If you think of fashion as a language where you can speak through different brands and colors and styles, well, if you're limited just because of your size, then your ability to speak and express yourself is also limited. So that's why I became ultimately founder of the Curvy Con. We are a plus size fashion convention that happens during New York Fashion Week. And our intention in, in starting that company was to create the ultimate kind of plus size fashion experience. As an influencer, um, you know, in the fashion world, I began to get the carpet kind of rolled out for me. But everyday women that are part of that 67%, they're not often um, given the same luxuries in shopping that someone like me as an influencer has the privilege to get. For example, um, I call it like a fat tax, which is the idea that if a plus size woman wants to shop online, her sizing might be different across different brands, right? So often what happens is to be efficient, if she needs a pair of 
pants, she's going to order both a size 16 and a size 18. She's going to try and figure out which one works for her. And then she's going to have to send one pair of clothes back, right? So even when you walk into a brick and mortar store and you might see them say, you know, we have our plus sizes online and they think they're doing something good. Well, you're actually asking that shopper to do even more, to do more work, to invest more, just to find the same pair of pants to fit her. So those are the types of things that I look to solve through my companies. Um, looking at size representation, both in fashion and beauty is important to me. Um, I see Daniel's back online, so I'll stop chatting for a bit. Hopefully I answered the question okay. <laughs> You answered the question beautifully and thank you so much and apologies for there being a delay. I am now back at my desk so people might walk past but we're just going to run with it. Um, but actually I think you know kind of size, size inclusivity when it comes to actually um, the products that we buy is is difficult especially when you layer an ethnicity onto that because actually we've got different body types and proportions and I think outside of just the conversation with women, we also have to consider men in that conversation because, you know, as, as a black man, I can have bigger thighs and a bigger, you know, backside. Um, and actually I might be broader in different parts. So it's those considerations, but we're gonna jump into that in a minute. Just to introduce myself, having run up the stairs, um, I'm Daniel Pieces. Um, and as I said, I run an organization called the Fashion Minority Report. Um, I've worked in the fashion industry for about 17 years now at this point, kind of cutting my teeth um, at uh, organizations such as Burberry, producing the runway shows, the global events and the global showrooms, working for the British Fashion Council, the equivalent of the CFDA. Um, and I've had really great jobs in the industry, but I got to a point where I felt that I wasn't using what I call my professional privilege in a way to pay it forward or pay it forward for those who are underrepresented um, and that doesn't just stop with me thinking about my intersectionalities around um, gender or ethnicity and sexuality. It's actually how can we support people from all walks of life to have equal opportunities or equitable opportunities to thrive. Um, and I know Sal, um, who booked me today, did put in kind of some notes that I recently um, gained a Vogue 100 innovator spot. Uh, for their 2023 list, which is nice. But let's talk about body diversity. Um, so actually, just kind of slightly going off topic from the questions that we have, who are the businesses or brands that you feel, CC are currently doing size inclusivity well? Great question. So when it comes to size inclusivity, it's so interesting. I was I just sat down with Elle magazine to talk about the 10 year anniversary of plus size at Fashion Week. It's been 10 years since the plus size body really showed up at Fashion Week. And what has that looked like over the past 10 years? And one of the things I, I spoke about is really like the ebb and flow of plus size fashion and service to plus size bodies, right? Sometimes we're hot, sometimes we're not. Sometimes they're investing, sometimes they're not, right? And so for me, <laughs> these days, one of the things that I really, I've had to kind of refocus, if I call out a brand and say they're doing it right, longevity and commitment is at the top of the list for me right now. I have been a consultant for brands who have come into Plus with a bang. And then when the pandemic hit, it's like, oh, we don't have it anymore. Sorry, we can't do it, right? And when I consult with those brands, the questions I ask are, well, how long did you give your petite line to catch on? Like, that's a specialty size. Like, you know, how are we defining what's worth an investment when it comes to specialty sizing? So over the past few years, some of the brands that I feel like are, are doing it right, I'm always going to give props to Lane Bryant. I think sometimes it's easy when it comes to, you know, the plus size brands that we almost take for granted. It's like, no, that's a brand that has been committed to the plus size body from the beginning exclusively. They are basically the gap of plus sizes. Could they do things better? Could they have more variety? Sure. But I never expect any brand to be all things to all people, right? But I know I could always get a good plus size pair of jeans at Lane Bryant. So they're always going to be at the top of my list. Um, another brand that I think is doing really well, I'm an ambassador and a consultant for Nike. And I've been really, really proud of the work that they've been doing for plus sizes, being able to see, you know, when I first started with the brand, you know, it was kind of like a 2X, a double X that they were pushing it with. Now we're, and even looking at some of the work Nike is doing around, um, like looking at Nike uh, apparel that supports women on their menstrual cycle or, you know, female, you know, whichever label you want to use, but 
people who menstruate having clothes that kind of serve in that too, right? So looking at body diversity across the board, I think Nike's doing a great job. Um, I think Dia & Co is doing a great job as well. They're really trying to, they're really making a, a good effort to be all things to all people when it comes to plus sizes and having a range all the way from your, I think they have a brand called Molly and Isadora that does great denim that's super accessible, but then all the way to 11 on array, which is more like what you might wear on the red carpet, right? So being able to have kind of that brand that is committed to serving a plus size woman holistically, I think those are some of the brands that I, I feel strongly are committed to plus size women for the long run, plus size bodies for the long run. I think to your point, um, when it comes to the men's extended sizes, there's still a lot of work to be done there. Um, but again, I think, you know, it ebbs and flows and I'm excited for the next push forward, which I think will be coming in the next like three to five years. Thank you. And I really do hope that it is within the next three to five years. And we know that these things um, take time to happen and that there needs to be adaptions within companies to actually be able to get to the next stage of being able to bring in or bring about more diversity and inclusion, especially when we look at, you know, products and, you know, speaking about even just the, the petites or kind of taller ranges and so on, um, it takes me back to um, Topshop. And Topshop mm. for me, especially in the UK, they had their flagship on Oxford Circus or Oxford Street. And they had, you know, sections for maternity where they also had sections for people who were petite or who had a more slender frame, um, all for those people who were more tall, um, which I think was great. And they really did in some way start to feel like a bit of an industry leader, um, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of driving a little bit more um, diversity in how people could shop. Um, but even then, those products, maybe aside from maternity, were put into different areas. They weren't, in that sense, inclusive by kind of being merchandised in and amongst um, the more mm -hmm. traditional sizing. And that, for me, is also a problem. And, you know, how do you feel about entering a store where things are kind of segregated? Like, you know, do you feel that there should be more of a mix amongst products? You know, because obviously it's easier when you merchandise online to some extent, but sometimes it gets put under a different tab. But between digital and in person, how do you feel? <laughs> okay, so my opinion on this is, I feel like it's a little controversial because one, I can say this, one of the things that I really appreciate a, a, about the brands who hire me to consult for them is that they understand that without an actual plus size person behind the scenes, it's hard to make decisions on what plus size people want, right? So for me, I think when it comes to merchandising, that is an area where the idea, the disconnect between whoever's on the team who likely isn't plus size and the plus size shopper, I feel like when it comes to merchandising, that is an area where I feel brands often get it wrong. I think often brands decide that plus size people don't want to walk in the store and feel segregated like they have to go somewhere else. Now, I'm going to pause and say they don't want to feel that they're segregated and have to go somewhere else if it's in the basement, in the dark corner, in the back, by the dusty part where the janitor is. Like if you put them where, where it's not desirable for anyone, no, they do not be, want to be segregated, right? At the same time, as a plus size shopper, I do not want to dig through all of your merchandise only to find that I'm not going to be served. I want to know. To me, if you have plus size, that shows me where to go. You're saving me time. You're saving me effort. You're saving me emotional heartache, right? Like, I don't want to see the skirt. I don't want to see the tennis skirt. Think it comes in the 2X. Dig through. See it only goes to a double XL, which is different than a 2X, and find that it doesn't. So now I've wasted time energy and emotions just to find out that I'm not being served. I actually would rather have a beautifully edited, I'm going to call out Nike again, when Nike launched that plus size Nike model that everybody was like, freaking out, like how could Nike have a curvy model? Like show me a plus size mannequin, show me a plus size edit, 
treat it with just as much style and grace and care and attention. But I actually do want to, like I go online, I can filter by size. I want you to do that for me in store because it's going to save me time, effort and heartache. So that is my kind of unpopular opinion. Typically when I work with brands, they say, well, we don't want to offend her. So we're just going to mix everything in. But I'm like, you right now are not at the point where you're carrying every single size from a zero X to a five X. You're not there and that's okay. So let's honor where you are and have this beautiful 3X edit, have this beautiful 4X edit, whatever you can do, whatever, wherever you are, honor that and, and advertise that to her so she knows exactly where to go and she can make her decisions in a more, you know, streamlined and educated way. No, and I agree. And it's really interesting. I think that there are ways to kind of integrate it so that you allow the person to have that sense of self and not feeling othered. But, you know, they also can have a sense of privacy. Um, And I think, you know, online, there are also ways to continue to do that better. Because actually, I think it's there are some brands who will showcase how many items are left in a particular size. Just when you kind of hover over it, Mm -hmm. you know, there's one left and there's two left of this. So actually, you're already, without me having to click through and go through the processes and steps, you're allowing me to understand that actually this isn't going to go up to what I need. And What's interesting is, you know, especially coming from a perhaps UK perspective, as that you mentioned kind of X's in terms of the, the quantity of X's that quantify a size. Um, whereas I then think actually, it, is it better to perhaps use the actual size of say a 16 or an 18 and a 24 and a 30 attached to when we kind of talk about the products? both in store and online, or is it better in your opinion to have the X's to equate? You know, what does that do to the customer on that journey? I think for me, it really depends on the garment. So in my opinion, when things have more stretch going to something like athleisure or athletic wear, the 1X, 2X to me really works well. Because for me, like I'm a size 14 on top, I'm a size 18 on the bottom, right? So I'm not going to, if I had to get like a cord set, I'm going to need completely different sizes, right? So something like leggings, I kind of need it to be more narrow up here, but in the hips, I need a little more. So knowing that it's like, I can choose between that 1X and 2X and know that the stretch is going to get me kind of, I get to decide, do I want it to be, you know, a little bit fuller and just, or do I want it to be a little bit more compressed? When it comes to something like denim, I want a 16, I want an 18, I want a 20, I want a 24, because that's going to be something that's a little bit more structured, right? When it comes to something like evening wear, I want a 16, 18. So I think if it's something that has more stretch, then I feel like the 1X, 2X, it kind of gives, you know, the idea would be that we all would be confident in our bodies, like me to be able to confidently say I'm a size 14 on top and a, you know, 18 on bottom, like, 10 years ago, my confidence, I would have been appalled to say my sizes, you know, out loud. Now I'm like, whatever, this is, it's just numbers, right? Our bodies are our bodies. So ideally we would all be confident enough individually in our bodies to kind of understand, all right, typically if I get into a one X, then that works for me. Um, And then to be able to confidently say like, when it comes to something more structured, I know I'm not going to be able to like squeeze into, you know, the 16 formal gown, I'm going to go ahead and need that 18. Um, So for me, that's what works best. And I think, um, you know, when it, I think a big part of also what I'll say is that brands, really can take more ownership of the way they build confidence in their customers. I can remember growing up being someone who cut the sizes out of my jeans because I was so embarrassed about what those numbers were, right? So as the brands look at their editorial and telling stories, make sure your editorial includes diverse sizing so that people can see like, oh my gosh, like this girl's a 24, but she's on the beach, you know, in the two piece as well with the other models living that life. So I can kind of attach myself to that lifestyle and kind of disassociate the number on the tag with the value of me as a person. I think brands can do a really good job of telling that story, increasing the confidence, which of course increases the shopping confidence, the buying power. And, and that's it, really. I think it's what is the narration that we put behind how we encourage customers to shop, how we create an experience for them. We all speak about, you know, um, retail theater. 
but actually everybody wants to be a part of that retail theater and actually often mm. we're excluding people and i think actually you know you touched on it with nike they do an incredible job and i think they do an incredible job across the landscape of diversity and inclusion looking at what they've done with the hijab looking at what they've done with yeah. um you know people who are perhaps amputees and so on they've really created a world there that allows so many more people to be able to buy into the products and the lifestyle of being a kind of Nike athlete. Um, and just thinking about kind of digital fitting rooms, for instance, um, you know, what is your stance on that? Who do you think is perhaps doing that well? Or, or what advances do you think we need to see? Particularly when it comes to plus sizes, it's tough. Because I think that there is kind of an assumption that if a woman is plus size that she is also curvy. And that's not always the case. You can be plus size and be narrow. You can be plus size and have no hips. You can be plus size and your waist to hip ratio doesn't you know, quite work. Not quite work, but it doesn't quite work with how the clothes are being presented, right? So if it's always being presented on like an Ashley Graham kind of hourglass figure and you are like, you know, maybe you're a size 18 on top and a 14 on the bottom, right? Like I, I'm can I also Go say ahead. like Ashley, Ashley Graham is not the only poster girl for like a fuller figure or for plus size like I love her she's it like she's walked the runway for Versace and whatever this past week that's awesome but there's also variations of it like let's not just pick the most popular girl to front the campaign for different yes. plus size bodies sorry that's what I wanted to yes yes and so what what I think you know when it comes to the digital fitting rooms I think that one, I, because I have, from a personal perspective, I'm always looking at like tactical and size. I am the person who's going to order a bunch of stuff. And so digital fitting rooms are not really my particular jam. I do think that for the online shopper who is also plus size, she does want to see that perfect hybrid of inspirational and aspirational, right? She wants to feel inspired that she is included. She wants to feel like the brand is, is telling her a story that her lifestyle can align with whatever the story is the brand likes to tell. She also does want to see herself, but it still needs to be like slightly elevated. So I think a lot about the apple shape customer, for lack of a better term. I know we always have these different terms for people, triangles, rectangles, fruits, whatever. But the girl who has maybe like, she holds her weight in her midsection. She's not often seeing models walking down the runway with a rounder tummy, right? But if there is a space within the site where she can see other, whether it be influencers, user-generated content, things like that, where she can see what her body will look like in that. A size, again, not all plus size bodies are curvy bodies. Not all curvy bodies are plus at the same time, right? So how do we make sure that the size 18 pair of jeans is shown in the way it would look on someone like me who might veer a little bit more towards what Ashley Graham looks like with my proportions, but also someone who might be shaped more like a Gabourey Sidibe or a Chrissy Metz, right? That same size 18 pair of jeans will fit us all, but we want to know what is it gonna look like on me? How should I style it? Do I need, can I style it with a crop? Can I tuck it in? Do I need mm -hmm. something a little bit longer or something, you know, just to understand yeah. that. So I think the visual representation does have to expand and be a little bit more diverse when you talk about plus size bodies. It's not just about she's bigger and her proportions just stayed the same. Sometimes the, the plus sizedness of her body shows up in different ways. To your point, it could be thighs, it could be hips, it could be butt, it could be gut, right? It could be anything. And we just want to make sure that that's celebrated and uplifted so she feels confident enough to make that purchase and take the chance. And so true. And if I could snap, but I don't want to disturb the office, I would. Um, but I think it's about <laughs> just saying, and I've not even mentioned Beyonce once, but now I have. Um, but I think it's really. <laughs> and, yeah, fine, hot, hot, hot. Um, but I think it's, um, I, we're coming to the end of this, so I just want to kind of get to the points, but I think it's really about the intelligence that we put behind the meaning of what we're doing when it comes to advancing how we connect with the customer who's got a different body shape. And I think that's where things like the metaverse or AI generally can perhaps come in to create more space so that we actually feel seen and so that we can feel safe. Because I feel like that's what the internet does for us in so many ways, especially when we look at tech, I should really say. Um, just as we're kind of uh, winding down, um, 
what I'd love to know is what are the innovations or advances that you'd like to see happen um, in the kind of digital space when it comes to size inclusivity over the next few years? You know, one of the, one of the most, one of the things I'm the most proud of at the Curvy Con that we were able to do is getting the brands who typically do not carry plus size in store to bring a full size run in to the Curvy Con. And we had dressing rooms so that women could try on clothes in all the different brands. I think I my my vision for that was that she would leave the Curvy Con and even if she didn't make a purchase, she would know, okay, in Old Navy, I'm a size 16 and Eloquy, I'm a size 18. And you know, in Nike, I'm a size 18, whatever. She could take those notes. And then again, she's not having to buy two pairs of pants and return it when she gets home. She can be more educated about how her body fits, you know, within that. So I think for me, when it comes to sizing, that's probably one of the biggest sources of confusion and stress for plus size shoppers. So I think anything that kind of will get us towards a place where people can be educated on what their sizing is across stores, no matter what the label is. I want to be able to travel and come visit you in London and go shopping and not have to spend half a day just figuring out where I fit in, right? So anything that brings us towards a more universal, you know, shopping and sizing experience to me um, is, is the way to go, especially because, you know, on a personal note, as someone who is kind of in a mixed size, like in between me, there are so many times that I feel confident enough to look at a dress that says a size medium, try it on and it looks great, right? But if I told my friends like, hey, I know you're a size 16, but try on this extra small, they won't believe me, right? But if you have that education on your body and how it works with sizing and how sizing works on clothes, actually there's more fashion available to you if you would just close your eyes to what the label says and be confident enough to just give it a try. My, my closet is full of clothes that technically should not fit me. <laughs> This is it. And I think so. Look, two things. One, come to London. We're going to go shopping. Let's make this happen. Um, and two, um, you know, I, I one thing I'd like to see happen is removing the need for people to have to buy multiple sizes of items just to see if it works. Because actually, we don't all have the income, especially when we start to layer diversity into it, to be able to go and have that expenditure. Because for me to go to a, a high-end or luxury store and have to buy two of the Loewe or two of whatever, this is what the issue is. But look, it's been so incredible um, to speak to you. Um, I believe that Janice is about to come back on. Um, but I've really enjoyed being able to have this conversation with you. And thank you so much to the Alavon, uh, Al Alvanon guys. Don't leave both of you. Can I just first of all tell you, first of all, Thank you, thank you, Cece, for letting us come in and work with your whole CurvyCon team and your community and to be able to take that immense amount of data and actually, you know, that was what actually educated all of our plus size uh, ranges, especially when we were actually looking at, you know, problems because we couldn't actually see how the data is important, the real people are important, and all of these things fit into an or such an authentic way that the both of you have been talking about, you know, how it is that, how, how retailers need to treat this problem. And it's a problem that needs to be treated well and with knowledge without sometimes the emotive part, but recognizes where that emotion actually, how that hinders a person. Because it really does, it breaks your heart when you walk in there and you, you feel like completely excluded. Um, and it's awful. <laughs> so um, with that, for companies and brands working on DEI initiatives, you have to contact the Fashion Minority Report as well as Cece. And with that, I thank you both for all of, you know, your very, very insightful parts. Um, and come and talk to us more because we need some help with some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. 